Hello, and welcome to another fully live episode of Hacking with Friends. My name is Cody Kinsey. I am a security researcher at Veronis, and today we have the elusive Alex Lin. Welcome back to the show. Hey, what's up? I think uh, this time you're the elusive one. I'm not sure if I can see you on my screen here. Oh, yeah. I see a black screen, but what's up? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a little odd. I, I, I see myself <laughs> on the monitor, but then on Restream, I don't see myself Very at all. Very mysterious. Yeah. Um, well, today, Cody is streaming from the ether. Yeah, exactly. You know, I am... attached to his corporeal body. Yeah, so first it was, so our first question was, what happened to Darren? I now, I guess the next question is, what happened to me? Uh, you're there. <laughs> All right, there we go. I'm back. <laughs> oh, thank God you for a second. Yeah, I, I feel like I very nearly was a, a, crypto, a cryptozoology victim. Um, but anyway, yeah. hello. Uh, so you've been you've been off doing your own thing for a while. I also right up, up uh, until the beginning of the stream, you were you were very compressed. So I had a lot of uh, <laughs> I had a lot of jokes ready for how you'd been compressed yeah. in an accident, and we were letting you recover. But welcome back. Yeah, it's great to be back. A lot of technical difficulties, but we're on. Ah uh, yes, sorry that we're starting a little bit late today. Alex was setting up his uh, his set for uh, the first time in quite some time. So Alex, what is it that you've been uh, working on lately? And uh, yeah, what have you what what have you had going on? There's been a lot of scrambling around, and also there will be scrambling around in a second because it looks like I actually need my laptop charger. But a lot <laughs> of things are coming up. So a few weeks ago, we got like that batch of 500 screwed up circuit boards. I don't know if you guys have been following us on Twitter, but we've been tweeting out a little bit about that. So I've been trying to fix a whole bunch of circuit boards so that way we can get them out into production. On top of that, I've also been preparing for a workshop that I'm going to be hosting this Saturday um, featuring the USB Nugget. I've been working on my Hope Talk, which is in a week and a half. That's quite scary. And you're also going to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, and besides that, also just some episode ideas. Um, some of you guys might have seen the video that I just put out very early this morning um on tracking down hidden cameras with wireshark since some of you guys asked for a more detailed follow-up um from the video we did a couple months ago so i've had my hands quite full yeah i remember when we put out that very popular can wireshark find hidden cameras for free episode the number one complaint we got was that we didn't go into enough technical detail so if you saw that episode yeah. and you really wanted a follow-up then um alex did a really good job of that <clears throat> if you go over to my screen in fact you can the see the latest video on, on Hack5. Uh, it already has almost 9,000 views, and it was just posted this morning, um, which is excellent, actually. I'm really proud of that. And it already has 35, uh, 33 comments. So um, yeah, really exciting to see. And uh, thank you for putting that out, because I feel like there was definitely some demand for uh, a little bit more detailed of a look into all of that. So um, yeah, so on my end, uh, Alex and I put out a new design for a circuit board, and we just had some of them come in. So the 500 uh, boards were supposed to go to me, and then these new prototypes were supposed to go to him, but instead they got reversed. So we got these new boards that have all these new cool designs on them, but the problem is they don't work. We've been having a little bit of a run of bad luck, and for whatever reason, the NeoPixel on these ones just will not turn on. Um, the fixes that we've tried make the screen like glitch out. It's super weird, so... Uh, yeah, we're gonna. The next generation of Nugget is gonna be delayed at least another couple of weeks while we figure out exactly why this uh, these new ones we've been working on just don't work. But then again, we only made ten of them, so it's not that big of a deal. But still, when you're making uh, hacking hardware, it can be a little bit harder than you think to try to make tweaks or adjustments or try to like update it because sometimes you just end up with things that don't work and you don't understand why for literally days. Because we're on day two of trying to figure out why this little run did not work. So. Um, uh, yeah, hardware is we also ran into We also have some other boards that are in process, like um, the surface mount version of the Nugget. Of course, you ran into more screw-ups there. There's a lot more um, just room for things to be messed up when you're working with things that aren't modules, when you're working with just discrete components. So we had some issues with that as well. Um, in addition to what we thought would have been a working design, like with those 500 modules, like we thought that that was a tried and true design um and we just something as simple as switching manufacturers for a single component screwed us up big time it was also quite costly so yes. yeah um so i also wanted to give a quick shout out a couple streams ago 
we said that we were having a little bit of a bug bounty around our nugget, and we wanted to see if anybody could find any problems with it so we could help make it better. If we switch over to my screen, we uh, went through and we selected a particular bug that was identified. This was by DeadSec Enzo, and we just reached out and uh, gave them, finally successfully, because I made a typo earlier, uh, we finally gave them a $100 Hack5 gift card. So thank you very much to everybody who participated in our USB nugget uh, Kind of bug bounty program because uh, yeah, it was very useful and we made a lot of very cool changes thanks to feedback that we got from everybody who picked up a USB nugget. So that was really awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's go ahead and start getting to some of the questions today. Of course, the question we always get is uh, what happened to Darren? If you guys ever want to see Darren again, you got to buy every USB nugget or else. No. So Darren has been on the stream a couple of times, um, which is funny because I guess like, you know, you see some streams, you don't see other ones. But yeah, Darren's been on the stream no less than twice. We've also had MG on the stream. We've had She Networks on the stream. We've had a lot of really great people. So, you know, Darren's still around, but he's busy making the next generation of Hack5 hacking hardware. So, uh, you know, sometimes he leaves a little bit of the content creation to us because that's what we do. So um, Darren is still alive and well, and you will see him again regardless of whether or not you pick up a nugget. I, 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 I walk it all back. Um, all right, what other questions do we have today? Actually, there were a number of questions on your video. Have you had a chance to read any of the ones that were there? No, but I can pull it up right now. Let's take a look. All Francisco right. says, okay, so if you guys haven't seen uh, my video quite yet, there's a particular scene where I dunk an IoT camera into the toilet for two <laughs> But Francisco asks, is your camera waterproof? Uh, no, but it was a mock-up camera that I created specifically for this video. Um, so I basically just used the ESP8266, which is a cheap Wi-Fi microcontroller. I basically programmed that to emulate the MAC address of a common camera vendor, Access Communications. I attached the battery to that, stuffed it inside of the camera, and then just dropped it in the toilet. Um, the bulb of the camera helped keep it afloat, so all of the electronics <laughs> were submerged underwater. But it's not an actual camera, and no, it's not waterproof. All right, we have another question that comes up pretty often. So if you've already heard this, I'm going to tell it again as quickly as I can. What happened to Nullbyte? So Nullbyte was a uh, company that was owned by a larger company called Wonder How To. And they had a lot of different sections that had uh, people writing articles for them. And one of those sections was a hacking section called Nullbyte, which I worked for. So I created the Nullbyte uh, YouTube channel, actually by accident, when I tried to upload a video of a pool party at DEF CON. And after a while, my friend David and I worked together on creating these episodes that were tutorial style and kind of went off of like what, what computer file was doing. After we made a couple well, actually like a couple dozen of these episodes, some of them finally started to go viral. We started getting paid a little bit and I was able to make a meager living off of that until some of our stuff really went viral and I got noticed by a larger company that was like, hey, do you wanna come work for us instead? So originally we kept making content on Nullbyte, but when the pandemic hit, they just stopped ordering episodes because the overall company ran into money trouble. They've been trying to sell Nullbyte. No less than three companies have attempted to buy it for a very reasonable price, but the people selling it are asking for like almost a million dollars, which is in my opinion, very silly because it's a bunch of aging episodes that are just getting more and more out of date like every year that they just sit there abandoned. So unfortunately, I never owned Nullbyte. It was owned by something else. I worked there for a while and I started the YouTube channel because I wanted to make the YouTube channel and they that was where I worked at the time. But unfortunately, I don't have any control over what happened to it because it's very sad to see all that really hard work go. Uh, and now there's like millions and millions of views. I think there was like 37 million views or something on like the top 10 Nullbyte videos. But you know, I don't have any say over what happens to that anymore. So this is where we make our content now. Hack5 is a great home for us. And uh, while it makes us sad to see that kind of split off, it's like, it's just one of those things, you know? All right. <laughs> I think I'm getting pretty succinct at, at answering that one. You get that pretty much every week, sometimes multiple times during the Q&A. Yeah, because it was a huge channel. A lot of people got started with hacking with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, got another question. Steven says, great video. Uh, in regards to the Wireshark one, is this kind of operation possible using a microcontroller or a Pi Zero to make it ultra portable? Yeah, so I actually created a setup a really long time ago um, for like a war skating video called the Audit Pi. It was basically just the Raspberry Pi with a little TFT screen slapped on top um, and also a battery sandwiched in between. I found that very useful for doing stuff like war driving. I was able to run um, some basic Wi-Fi reconnaissance tools like the Aircrack Suite. I also tested out Wireshark and some other stuff like that. 
So that one was super portable. Of course, it's um, plug and play with standard um, like adapters, GPS modules, stuff like that. So this is just a Linux computer. So that I've tested out. Um, a microcontroller would be interesting. I created a project in a similar vein a while back called Probe Hunter, which was used for basically tracking down. Well, actually, when I created it based off this crazy idea that someone pitched to me where they wanted to track down like a camera <laughs> they lost in the forest. I think I remember telling you about this before, Cody. Hmm. So they like went on a hike or something crazy like that. They lost their phone and they had no way to track it down. So they asked me to create this device that uses um, pro requests in order to detect um, and triangulate like the location of this lost cell phone. So I created a device that was based off the Espresso microcontroller um, and also a directional antenna that he was able to use in order to pinpoint the location of his phone. So in theory, it's possible. Um, tuning it to find something like a hidden camera is entirely possible. Um, it could be something we explore in a future episode, but that'd be interesting. Yeah, especially if it was just like a micro, uh, sorry, if it was just like a Raspberry Pi zero w or something like that's totally possible because it's capable of running yeah. linux and running wireshark and doing everything that you did in the video just very slowly maybe oh yeah yeah the latency was pretty bad um it was also like recording data to an sd card um and the problem with that is it's just like a slow tiny 32-bit microcontroller so eventually once it started reaching like hundreds of um like packet logs in the file it just started getting really slow also, Zam says, Alex, smack your camera to reset the autofocus. I know, I've been struggling with this all week. The autofocus <laughs> garbage. Yeah, it does. Who kn that's a that's a great that's a great attempt. It um did not work, sadly. All right, so another question we have, uh, and this was from our last live hacking QA with me and Michael, was what is your opinion on how to hacking slash pen testing books? I feel like by the time they get written and released, the material is already outdated due to how fast tech moves. Um, do you have any opinion on that, Alex? Like hacking how to uh, slash pen testing books? Um, books haven't really been my thing because I just generally find like beyond learning the basic techniques for hacking, if you're reading a book that focuses on a specific like Python tool or like a subset of tools or stuff like that, like not only are new and better like proof of concepts and tools coming out like every day, but like those things also get updated so quickly that I don't really find it useful. Um, sometimes theory books are good. There was this pretty good hacking book that I got started with, but I now forget the name of it. It was something about C2 in the title, like command and control and like different um, exploit techniques and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Usually if I'm reading like books or focused literature, I just find like higher level topics generally more useful stuff where it's like anecdotal um, or just like field experience from a particular person. Um, if you're trying to learn how to like hack or like learn how to use Metasploit or like a particular tool, not so much. Uh, <laughs> there's some great beginner resources out there though that are being continuously updated. There's this um, particular GitHub repository that I point to sometimes, I'll see if I can find it, but they have a list of a lot of awesome hacking resources. Um, that I actually reference from time to time for a whole bunch of stuff like software defined radio, Wi Fi hacking, um, social engineering, stuff like that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I would say two things. One, you are being absolutely roasted in the in the comments. Um, I think Zam was suggesting perhaps if you were to move the laptop forward uh, screen forward slightly so it's not hard focusing on that, the, the camera would hey. focus on you instead. Um, but now I can see also, my screen though because. <laughs> And who knows if it'll even work. But um, yeah, so I, I would also say that f books that teach you fundamentals are always great. Even if the technology moves on, the tactics are generally the same. So like learn, like books about Wireshark, books about Nmap, books about like penetration testing in general, like what the overall theory is, that sort of thing. Like those are always valuable because even if the technology changes, the tactics will largely still be the same. All right. Um, so another Not only question. Are you guys laughing in the background, but I'm also seeing all these roast comments. <laughs> all right. So another question is, can you make a video on the basics of hardware hacking? A lot of people underestimate it, and it would be nice to see a brief introduction introduction to hardware hacking. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Um, I don't do like as much advanced stuff as like most hardware hackers do. My um, general 
expertise, if you could even call it that, is using like microcontrollers in order to solve problems or like sketchily hack things by like, you know, hooking up like a RS-232 UR cable to like a router to like reverse engineer the firmware, like some dumb stuff like that. Um, but I could walk you guys through like the basic um, like tools we need to get started with hardware hacking, maybe do like an overview of microcontrollers, stuff like that. <laughs> mm. Yeah, sorry. A lot of these comments are very funny. Um, <clears throat> so one question that I really like as well is, um, okay. do you think that the job market for cloud security will increase in the next few years? Um, based on everything that I've seen, like I would say absolutely. That's because so many large businesses have decided that the cloud is more secure, even though that might not necessarily actually be true. So um, yeah, I would say that if you are somebody that's interested in cloud security, like a lot of the time, it's rushed, it's not deployed properly, there are issues and they really need people to help with that because uh, even at Verona, it's like the security researchers here have found like multiple really serious issues with well-known cloud vendors, some of which have gotten us in like small amounts of trouble um, by releasing and then having a bunch of people being like, wait, you could do what? Uh, so yes, cloud security is a huge topic because everybody uses these cloud services and a lot of the time people just, you know, basically rely on them being implemented very, very securely for their own security and for their customer security. So yes, cloud security, I think is going to have a lot of, uh, just need for skilled people in the immediate future. Yeah. Cloud security is hot. Like, especially among hackers too, like if you can get access to like, well. All right, it seems as though we've lost Alex, uh, at least for a minute. So, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and take another question because uh, Alex, is, I guess, is gonna need to figure out um, maybe how to fix his focus and then what happened. But one question is, is there a Raspberry Pi shortage? So uh, yes, there's absolutely a Raspberry Pi shortage. And if you haven't noticed this, oh, hello, Alex. Um, if you haven't noticed that there's a Raspberry Pi shortage, you haven't maybe been on like eBay or Amazon or any one of these websites that sells them, um, like at least a month ago when I checked, the prices on these were extraordinarily high and it was really difficult to find one for less than $100. So there's absolutely a Raspberry Pi shortage going on right now. Part of it is the chip shortage and another part is they have been focusing on making a certain kind of Raspberry Pi at the exclusion of all other ones. So a lot of the Raspberry Pis that you might be looking for might have not been made for a while and the stock might have just run out. So if you're confused- the Pico in particular? Oh no no! I mean, I mean, like the Raspberry Pi four, the Raspberry Pi three, like oh. all like a lot of these are just sold out, or they're going. Oh no! For like, you, you mentioned like a new Raspberry Pi that they're focusing on. I did notice though that they're like switching to, uh, they're focusing more on microcontrollers than they are like their microcomputers, at least recently. Yeah. Zam in the chat can probably explain it a bit better than I, but uh, in general, I, b I believe they're focusing on like in like the industrial style Raspberry Pis that are like like oh, almost yeah. like the blade looking ones, and yeah, those ones they're are doing little... that. Uh, yeah, they're doing that at, like the exclusion of like uh, the other ones. So that's why the prices are really high right now. And if you have a project that relies on Raspberry Pis, it is truly difficult to find one. So um, yeah. Yeah, I do think those are cool. I think they come in like M two form factor or something like that. But the idea mm -hmm. is they're just like a module that you can plug into um, like your own development board. Like, as you said, for more industrial applications rather than just like a regular computer. Um, so one question is, when will I demonstrate PowerShell tools for living off the land hacking techniques? So I, um, as a matter of fact, haven't had my Windows computer for a little while. Alex, do you remember why that happened? <laughs> I haven't had my Linux computer in a while and then as do, you that, remember, uh, do you remember this move you used to do with it? Oh, yeah. And then you would flip the... <laughs> the screen violently. Yeah, I think I know who the culprit is here. Yeah, but I'm currently yeah. using uh, Cody's computer since I violently destroyed mine. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. Um, but as a result, I haven't really been doing too much Windows stuff, but I just got another ThinkPad. And I know that somebody was gonna ask me what ThinkPad I got. So look, I pulled it up, here you go. We can switch to my screen and I can forestall the question. So I don't know if I like this computer or not, but this is the one that I ended up getting off of eBay. Um, I was really hoping that Lenovo would just give me one so I could say nice things about it and not have to pay for it. But I just finally ran out of patience and frankly, I just don't have the energy to bat through them anymore. So um, I will, I'll update you guys about how well this works. The one I got randomly has a touchscreen, which I wasn't expecting. And um, 
like LTE, so I can put in a, like my extra SIM card and just like have data on it, which is uh, I was not expecting, and it's kind of cool. But it also doesn't have an Ethernet port, which is kind of lame. And there's a couple other complaints oh, I have. But yeah, but aside from that, like it was a, I'm, I mean, it was like four hundred dollars. So compared to a MacBook Pro, like I'm pretty happy, and uh, I will be doing more Windows stuff now that I have a computer to torture and test stuff out on. Um, Nice. Yeah, I I even now have a one terabyte SD card that fits in the back of it that I'm going to be using as my like sketchy like Kali Linux like uh, maybe I have to like put it in the microwave or like you know like destroy it someday. Um, little like, did you say one terabyte there. SD card? Yes, it was a hundred dollars. Right? Sounds crazy. Yeah. I also it, hate SD cards. Yeah. <laughs> my my general position on them is they suck. The amount of times I've corrupted an SD card just using it with the Raspberry Pi are also just like. Even filming this week's episode, like I corrupted an SD card twice. It's like, oh, <laughs> not going to store any sensitive yeah. data on that. Oh well, don't worry. This was a micro SD card, so I'm sure it will be oh, much boy. more reliable. Nice. Um, oh, sure enough, um, Zam has chimed in in the chat explaining the true nature of the Raspberry Pi shortage. Thank you. Um, I I merely summoned you, but that information is very valuable. Uh, okay, so. Um, we have another question from the q and I did with Serena, which is, is it possible to decrypt Windows BitLocker encryption without having its recovery key? Alex? No clue. I'm not a Windows guy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I would say with my very limited knowledge of how this works, uh, no, it probably would not. OK. We have another Next question one. that I'm pretty sure oh, I yeah, could answer. Do you recommend Python for hacking? Yeah, hacking is a pretty wide purview, but I generally use Python for automating stuff. Um, for this week's episode that I did on Wireshark tracking, there was a particular part where I showed like how to construct a display filter for types of IP cameras or like IoT vendors or stuff like that. Um, and I also showed like how to use an OUI lookup tool in order to get like a list of common vendors. So I actually started working on a quick Python program that just um, creates an API request to that vendor list creates a display filter and lets you import it into Wireshark, just as like a little quick proof of concept. Um, but I find Python really useful for that kind of thing, where it's just like you want to spin up a quick prototype or a tool doesn't exist yet and you want to create your own. Um, or maybe you want to string together a bunch of tools that are already out there. Um, and using libraries like the operating system library, like import OS, you can also call like operating system stuff. So for example, I recently created like an automated flasher for a whole bunch of nuggets. That's literally just a Python script that references a bunch of Linux calls and um, just like strings together stuff like ESP tool, um, LS, USB, and like a few other things. But Python's super versatile. I almost always using it for something. Yeah, I would say also this is a question where it's just like because um, I I find like Rust and Go kind of attract like the same people and like the same like intentions for like yeah. low level access and like all the stuff. Um, so the question is like, are you com are you a computer scientist or are you like a like a, a persistent person that would like to string some stuff together into a proof of concept? If you're a computer scientist right. and you want like low level access to the stuff, then you know go with Go, go with like Rust. Um, but if you are someone that doesn't you know work with like C plus plus or like under like understand how lower level languages work, then like work with Python. It's so much easier and you can still get tons of stuff done. It might not be as efficient or low level, but it will definitely get the job done in most cases. Um, it's just like you do sacrifice some lower level control and maybe some features you you don't quite get access to if you're using a language like Python that is you know, not compiled. Yeah, I also find that there's just like a lot of libraries that are already spec'd out there for like a lot of the things I'm trying to do. Like for example, a really useful one is Scapy just for like, crafting custom packets, stuff like that. There's just like a ton of support, a ton of user created libraries that are already out there for most of the hacking stuff you're trying to do. Yeah, so a comment also was that the Wireshark color marking video was helpful. Um, if you guys want to see more Wireshark content, I'm also considering trying to you know, push more of our content creators to cover the basics of Wireshark, how to do some interesting things. I'm trying to have one of our other content creators, Ariza, maybe come on and teach about different Wireshark filters, like capture filters versus display filters, and give some examples of like useful like capture filters. Because like nobody really talks about that very often, but they're so fundamental to using it. So um, I mean, all that stuff, I think, we could expand on if you guys want to see it. So let us know in the chat if you want us to do more fundamental Wireshark stuff because it seems like just creating those filters and being able to like stain the packets different colors to like make them stand out is like an actually really useful tip that a lot of people maybe got some value out of. Yeah, uh, I think I briefly covered that. 
um, in like a, I think it was like a nugget video, but um, I set up like a custom filter that allows you to detect stuff like the authentication attacks and that stuff's really useful. I also saw that one of the commenters on my video noted like ways you could track um, different graphs simultaneously and also like color code them, which is really cool. I didn't get to mess around with that quite yet, but there's apparently a thing you can do where you can like um, cross check like different signal strengths and also like plot different things and color code them. But yeah, there's a lot of really cool features in Wireshark that are just, like poorly documented and you don't really know that they're there until you happen to stumble across them. But color coding is one of those things you should definitely know how to do. All right, so um, a well-known Nugget aficionado, uh, Evo Defense, has a question, which is a Wasp Zap video. Well, my my response is, what do you want to see? I've got I've made a couple different OWASP Zap videos, including the one where I used it to just send the B movie script to a bunch of scammers. So let me know what kind of uh, like pen testing or like app, uh, like web application pen testing stuff you want to see, and I can absolutely do some more OWASP Zap videos. I really enjoy the tool, and I feel like I understand it a lot better now. So um, yeah, I might even start covering more of the Port Swigger. Um, like vulnerable applications that they have in their academy. Uh, Cause honestly, I learned a ton just going through and like using the tools there and like kind of following along with online guides. So if anybody's interested in that, let me know. I really enjoyed making those. They didn't do super well. So if I know what topics everybody wants to see, maybe I can make some more that like do super well and I'll, I'll spend some more time on them. Cause for a while I was on a roll, but I kind of like, you know, they, they just did okay. So, all right. Hmm, question from Taekwon Gong. Cody, how do you choose and prepare for setting up your content? How much study time do you have for setup? Oh, OK, that's a great question. Um, so if I'm doing like an episode uh, on something that I've never done before, let's say that I see a script online, I'm like, hey, that'd be cool. Like, maybe I should cover that. I'll usually allocate like a day before, maybe an hour, to try it out and make sure everything works as advertised. Otherwise, I have to scrap the whole thing. Um, if I don't do that, then I risk setting up the lights, getting somebody here to help me record it, and then ending up wasting their time because it just doesn't work. So that hour ahead of time of like testing out a script, making sure it runs the way that it's supposed to, is like if you don't do that, you end up wasting two, three hours after. After I've gone through and worked something all the way through, maybe it's a, like a lab or a demo or something else that I want to show off, then we'll go through and I actually, like it, it doesn't take us very long to film it because I've been doing this forever and I, I can just power through like 10 takes in a row until I get a perfect one. Um, but it's really weird and takes a long time to get used to just talking to like a, a dead glass lens, like the one I am now and not just feel like very strange about it. Um, it really does take like a year of just doing this continuously. So I find it to be much weirder and that it, it took a lot longer to do back before I got used to that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically how I, you know, a, a lot of the stuff that I do now is stuff that I already have proximity to. So like, I'll have to learn something in order to like make a feature for the nugget or something. And then I'll turn around and I'll make an episode about it. Or I myself will decide, hey, I want to learn web application pen testing and I'll start working on it and then turn around and show you guys my favorite labs that I've done. Cause I'm just so excited. I just want to show someone. Um, that's usually how I can cut down on the amount of like research time I need to do in order to find new topics. Cause often it'll be something that I, I set as a personal goal and then I find the best parts of it and I can turn around and share it with other people. So if you're in school or if you're learning something and you're looking for ways of like maybe you know, making your own content. Um, it certainly worked out really well for me. I've got to meet really wonderful people. I've got to have an excuse to be around other content creators. And I've even got to get into tons of conferences as press for free, which is kind of like an underrated, I think, experience of being a content creator. Once your stuff starts to take off, it's really easy to attend hacking events. So that's why it's kind of worth it to go through the process of making it sometimes, even if you don't get a big response initially. I think I'm on the same page about pretty much all of that. And the longest, the thing that took me the longest to get used to was definitely like looking at just like a dead camera, but now I pretend it's like Mike Wazowski <laughs> from Monsters, Inc. Just <laughs> all, maybe like Hal 9000, but um, yeah, when I first started making videos, I was just like shooting them in the park in like random places, <laughs> um, like for my worst skating video and a couple um, of other ones. But um, now it takes me like somewhere around like an hour or so to get like the set put up. And I honestly try to improvise as much as I can when doing the shooting. There's only like so much that you can prepare before um, it starts to become boring. 
All right, so we have a question, and I cannot answer your question, but I can raise it, uh, raise it up to uh, have somebody else in the chat answer it. Love the show. Actually caught your live stream. Yay. My question, which mobile is the best to run Kali Net Hunter from the list of supported mobile phones, or are they all the same? So they're not all the same. I tried to do this myself, and in fact, Zam sent us a Nexus in order to try to get this up and running, and I spent a full... Oh my gosh, I think like like day and a half trying to get this all set up. It just was really difficult to get it unlocked and, and fully working. So I was not able to get it set up myself. And I honestly, you know, after the first day, I was just like, this is too hard. So um, I haven't even gotten it set up. I can't really tell you which one is best, but hopefully somebody in the chat has gotten it set up and has a good experience. I hear Nexus phones are pretty good uh, or like tablets are pretty good for that, but I haven't been able to get it work to work myself. Um, all right, one question is, I have a question. Do you think that having certs is more relevant today to get a job in cybersecurity or self-teaching and showing what you can do to the employer? Um, I think that if you're involved in the community and you are producing things, like you're you know, you're trying things out and making proof of concepts, like you're contributing things to GitHub, um, that is a very compelling argument that you're a self-starter, you're involved in the community, you're keeping active with your stuff, and you're not in a bubble thinking you've learned everything that there is to learn. You're in a continuous cycle of learning. And like a lot of people like to see that, you know? It's an encouraging sign for when you hire someone to know that they're invested in the community and they're continuing to learn beyond what their initial education was. Um, that being said, I think certs do demonstrate that you're able to have certain skills just out of the box. So, I mean, it really does depend on what kind of job you want. If you want a special job that nobody, or not nobody, but that not very many other people have because your skills are special, then certs might not really reflect what your overall skills are. You might be better at something else. Like I'm better at content creation uh, than I am necessarily at pen testing. So like a certification that says like, you know, I'm a great pen tester might not be, or like at least it's like security related, might make people think I do pen testing when in fact my skills are somewhere else, you know, and maybe just producing a bunch of work is a better way for me to get noticed by a cybersecurity company. Again, it really comes down to exactly what you want to do. If it is networking stuff uh, that you want to go into, then yeah, absolutely. A certification will show people they can trust you at least initially to know the very basics of what you're supposed to know. And I think that that's, uh, if you can get it, and if it's not too much of a burden for you, very useful for a lot of people. But if you've been in something that's loosely related to security, or, you know, if you're already into networking or IT or something like that, then I feel like sometimes certain might not be necessary if you've already done security in some context in your job and you know you have the capacity to learn more and you've demonstrated that too so that would be my two cents on that i got to catch the tail end of that i finally fixed my focus so you guys can stop bullying me please but, yeah, um... script, script kitty club got in the last one at alex wipe your camera you're very blurry yes it's a pretty big roast <laughs> um, but yeah i agree um for the most part like I don't have any certifications and it really depends like um really what you're trying to achieve if you're someone like me that's just has a wide palette of different things you do um i guess certifications really just prove that you have like a baseline knowledge or like understanding of a particular thing i do help um but honestly if you're like out there creating content or you have like a particular thing like a resume or you have like a blog or something like that that you can also use um to lend credibility to your experience that also really helps um, so there's another question. What state is best to live in to work in cybersecurity? So there's two answers to that. If you want to like network with other cybersecurity professionals, then like there's great cybersecurity communities in places like Southern California or New York or San Francisco or even like places like Portland. Like just because there's you know lots of people, uh, but those places are also expensive and the industry is a little crowded there. So if you um, want to work in cybersecurity and you know also have more money, then there's other places elsewhere in the country where you can live where you might not be around cybersecurity people, but you can afford to travel, you can save, and you can actually, you know, like, like have kind of a living wage off of your current job without needing to pay expensive city prices. So it really depends on what you want access to. If you want to be around a lot like a hacker space and like a lot of other things, then um, a city is obviously the place to go. If you want to be able to like, save at the end of the month, um, then maybe other places might be a better place to go. It all depends on whether or not you can work remotely. If you can, then you might have a lot more options open to you than you might imagine. And maybe you can just fly into hacker conferences because you can actually save up and afford it or get your company to pay for it. All right, so- We all let's just finally got my RTL SDR working. Would love to see some intro level SDR videos. I actually got to mess around with my cheap RTL SDR dongle this week. Um, still learning how to do stuff with it, but if I figure out how to do anything cool or figure out like replay attacks or something like that, I would love to demonstrate that. 
Hey, here's a question about your video. What was the Panda directional antenna model you recommend in your find a wireless camera video? Oh, there's actually maybe two or three. So the low profile option um, that supports dual band is the Panda PAU0A. It's like really tiny. It honestly, it looks like it's the size of like a Logitech Bluetooth um, dongle or something like that. It's really small, it's discreet, supports dual band. Um, that's typically the one that I'm carrying. Um, for the video in particular, I'm using the Panda PAU06. It's only on 2.4 gigahertz. Um, but yeah, pretty standard dongle. And then the beefed up version that I usually recommend for more advanced stuff and also supports like adding external antennas is the Panda PAU09. That one's dual band. You can plug in SMA antennas for stuff like directional capture. Nice. Um, so one question from Script, uh, Script Kitty Club is, who runs Hack5? Where did you get a space for your show? So around the time that um, I was unhappy with how much I was getting paid at Nullbyte, uh, I went to the RSA conference in San Francisco, and I hit up Darren Kitchen and was like, hey, like I already make content. I would love to make content with you. I'm not happy with the current arrangement I have, and like I want to, I basically want to walk. And he agreed to meet with me. We had a great conversation. We went to his place later and talked about like the kind of show we would want to make, and we established some trust. And in the end, we got to start making uh, two different shows on Hack Five. One of them is the Readya show, where we try to make it kind of like more MythBusters like and go after you know common assumptions or like tools that hacker use. And then we also have the Hackbyte show, which is pretty much a direct continuation of Nullbyte and kind of covers the same sorts of topics in a tutorial style. So uh, we propose both of these to Hack5. Uh, Darren really liked it. And Darren is the person who's in charge of Hack5. But everybody who has a show there is their own the boss, basically. They're their own independent content creator. And we all contribute video uh, content to the show. Um, and this platform, you know, obviously benefits us by making sure our content gets to be in front of a lot of people. Um, we also have our own channels. Uh, I believe that, let's see. Security Forward, we have the Readya channel, which is like our production team's channel that we don't really put too much on right now. Um, I mean, there's, there's our content is kind of all over the place right now, but we get to stream now to a bunch of different channels all at the same time when we do this, which is really cool. So it all kind of worked out to be able to reach a lot of people all at the same time. Mike says, I would like to use one of these Wi-Fi microcontrollers simply as an internet repeater, perhaps solar powered, a couple of them to get my library's Wi-Fi a couple blocks away. Yeah, so there's actually um, two proof of concepts I have in mind. So I think I did a video a while back on using the ESP32 maybe as like a NAT router. So basically um, a thing that allows you to extend your Wi-Fi connection. I know that you, Cody, also did a video on that with the ESP8266. Yeah, I um, like to use so yeah. punching bags. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Um, although there is a lot of lag time, there's a lot of latency just because it's a microcontroller that's having to route that traffic. Um, if you're just doing really basic stuff, like maybe passing values from a sensor or something like that, that's typically an application where this might actually have enough like power and throughput to do that. Um, as an actual internet repeater for your library's Wi-Fi that's a couple blocks away, I would probably suggest using like a Raspberry Pi or something. That's actually um, a thing I had to do um, when I was poor, well, poorer. I still am poor, but I used a Raspberry Pi and a Wi-Fi dongle as a repeater um, in order to snag free Wi-Fi. Um, but another proof of concept that I tried, which is actually pretty interesting, was just setting up a mesh network with a whole bunch of these Wi-Fi microcontrollers to see just how far I could extend extend the range for. And I was able to get something close to, I think, like a mile and a half, just with like eight different ESPs all communicating with each other, although there was a lot of lag time. So as a proof of concept, it's cool, it's possible, um, albeit you'll probably have slow connection. Um, Evo Defense says, Hack5 only ships to certain places. That would imply some Hack5 devices can only travel to certain places also. So I never like to spoil a, a good Easter egg, but it's true. If you bring a Hack5 product to a restricted country, it will burst into flames the second you power it on. So. <laughs> Be wary that if you're unauthor if you're smuggling in a Hack Five product legally, they have to include the self-destruct circuit. So for if you travel to, I guess, Iran or something, and then start using it to, you know, get into some shenanigans. So uh, yeah, keep your hands clear if you're in a restricted country and you've smuggled in a Hack Five tool. Someone says, 
Haha, ha. Alex said wipe my dongle. Yeah, first I had to wipe my, <laughs> first I <lost> my dongle. <laughs> uh, so one question is, uh, is it illegal for me to send my hack five gear to uh, uh, any other country? Most countries are fine, but there are several countries that are like restricted. So if you're sending it from the United States to one of those countries, then I don't know because I've never done it. Um, I, uh, I, that would be an interesting question to pose, but I think that some, it's like the, the transfer technology, cause it is technically like offensive pen testing stuff. Like if you're like taking it or sh sending it or shipping it to certain areas, um, if it's like, if you're taking it there with the intent to sell it, then like that might be a thing. Like, I don't know. I'm not an expert or a lawyer or like a, a, a transportation trade broker or some, some, like something like that. So I'm not really totally sure about that, but I do know that there's certain places that Hack5 can't ship to and that I've been reliably told that the products will explode if you take them there. Sounds about right. Um, someone asks, kind of random, this is something I've been interested in, uh, music projects with, I think, microcontrollers, Raspberry Pi or something. I lost the question. But an interesting one that I saw pop up on my feed the other day was um, a project by Adafruit using capacitive touch and actual fruits in order to control like input on a microcontroller. So the way that this works is capacitive touch basically lets you use like capacitance and like a loose wire to detect like when an object is being touched just based off like the capacitive properties. So there was a cool demonstration where like a bunch of actual like fruits and like random objects were hooked up to like wires and these were fed to like a microcontroller to detect when basically they were being touched. So you could use this in order to um, create like a MIDI thing that you can feed into your computer and like make sounds or you could create like your own MIDI keyboard or something like that. I found that really cool. Music projects are something I've been interested in for a while. I've seen a lot of like reactive music art using microcontrollers. Um, I don't have any particular projects in mind, but maybe I'll share them next time if I can find them. Here's a question. Is this live? No. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so I've, I've heard of some of these things too. On TikTok, I constantly see people just connecting to like mushrooms with like a microcontroller and then like making it like sing by like turning it into like a MIDI controller and then like having it like play <laughs> over a synthesizer. So there's all sorts of crazy projects you can get into when you have like a little microcontroller like the ESP32S2 that can uh, identify itself as like a MIDI controller and then like, you know, output data to a computer. Yeah. It'd be really cool to hack that uh, singing Billy the bass you have on the wall and hook him up to something. Oh, yeah. So and hook up like Amazon Alexas or stuff like that. Yeah. So another question we have again is, do you recommend Hack the Box yet, uh, yet again? Yes, we do. Um, that and then some of the things like the Port Swigger Academy are some really excellent tools for just honing your skills and making sure you understand the basics of pen testing and web application stuff. So if you're interested in that, then yes, we do recommend that. Uh, and my personal one, though, is Port Swigger, I think is really cool. Uh, I like the fact that they have those vulnerable web applications where you can use uh, um, a wasp zap for free to learn all these great things. Um, although they kind of hope that you'll use Burp Suite, but let, like, then why make it so expensive? You know. Um, here's a question: Is it possible to get your main machine hacked via a virtual machine? Can they get access to the main machine through a virtualized environment? Uh, that has me a bit scared. Yes, so it is possible to do what's called a container escape. It's very rare, and when it happens, it's usually considered quite severe, and it's it's uh, not something that happens very often. But it is possible. It's just um, you would be burning a pretty serious uh, zero-day vulnerability in order to do that because um, you're not supposed to be able to do that. That's a big no-no. Oh, here's a very serious question: KFC or Pollo Loco? Pollo Loco. It, that's not hard. Yeah, yeah that's not, that wasn't hard. Um, KFC. Sorry, a cryptozoologist <laughs> is calling me to inform me that he likes KFC. Spread the word. <laughs> um, so we have a nudge from Zam to share the great news that he has received his Flipper Zero. So as soon as oh, yeah. he is done uh, drooling over it, he has promised to wipe it off and bring it over and let Alex use it. So Alex, you could be uh, <laughs> the first one on our team to get to actually see um, a flipper, which is really cool because we've uh, we haven't gotten oh, our hands on great. one yet. Yeah, that's really cool. Although I could probably lend my expertise in wiping it down. I've wiped off a lot of things today. My dongle and my camera being mm -hmm. through them. <laughs> All right. So um, one question: If I hack from a distant country, I go to prison? Question mark. Um, I, it depends. If you're in North Korea, then probably not, um, you know, but if you are in a country that has like an extradition treaty or like at some point, you know, like, like doesn't care 
about your security anymore and someone finds out who you are, then yes, you very well could end up going to a prison or some sort of detention center somewhere. Um, oh, Crimes somebody, are illegal, don't do it. Yeah, also somebody's asking, what is a flipper? Oh, it's basically a multi-protocol, like, wireless penetration thing. So it's basically in a form factor, like a little box, there's a screen and there's like a D-pad. And it's like a gamified interface that you can use to screw around with different protocols. So they have like some near field stuff. So you could clone like, um, like badge and systems. I believe they have um, some longer range, like radio stuff that can open up a really cool proof of concept was like, um, the radio could be used to open up Tesla charging ports. I've also seen like garage doors or stuff like that. Um, but the point is, it's like an all in one platform that supports a whole bunch of different wireless protocols. Um, with a cute gamified interface that also has um, like breakout pins if you want to add on like other um, like hardware modules and stuff like that. It does a whole lot. Alex, there's a question specifically for you. Oh, gosh. Alex, do you enjoy working with Cody and have you expanded your knowledge? <laughs> no. Feels a little loaded. <laughs> yeah, I've known Cody for... I think like three years now, I think we initially met when I was like posting a bunch of sketchy stuff on my Instagram as like an eighth grader. I was like showing off like all these cool hacks, like how to hack your TI-84 calculator to like <laughs> put Wi-Fi on it. Um, I was like doing a whole bunch of like crazy stuff that Cody noticed. And we first met up at Null Space Labs, I think like two years ago. I think I showed up for like a... Um, I think it was like a workshop or maybe before that we did the creep detector proof of concept. That was like the first thing that we worked on together, which was essentially like a tool that you could use to detect if like perverts are filming you by tracking down <laughs> the signal strength. So that was really cool. Um, and ever since then, we've been working on mostly microcontroller projects like the Nugget and stuff like that, as well as content, um, the live streams and all that. So yeah, it's been really enjoyable. Have I expanded my knowledge? Yes. Um, it's really like... It's a heuristic and hands-on process. I find that I learn stuff a lot better, like just by doing things and like being motivated to come up with my own projects and ideas. Um, and I find myself motivated to try out like new proof of concepts and stuff like that, um, rather than like learning in the traditional sense, like going to school or like studying for like certifications or stuff like that. Um, so I can say that personally, I've expanded my knowledge just through like all the random hands-on things that we've been doing. Um, and it's definitely been, um, a great experience for me. Oh, all right. Here's a question, but I don't understand the setup. What do you think about people being swatted, but with their computer instead? Like, like the SWAT team is armed with their computer. Like, I'm, I'm not totally sure what's happening. Like I under, I understood the first part of the question, but when you said, but with their computer instead, that's where I became very confused. Um, Maybe they like fly swat them, but with the laptop. Like swatting is just one of those things where like invariably you're going to get caught. So like you just have to be someone who doesn't care about eventually getting caught. And then like, you know, like people, I, I heard a case of back when I lived in Los Angeles, uh, somebody there who was very notorious for swatting and would do it for pay. And that's how he like made extra money because he just didn't care about getting caught. And he like, you know, just go to a pay phone, like try it out and eventually got caught, got into a bunch of trouble because somebody um, actually got shot from being swatted sure. because of that dude. Um, so yeah. Um, it's not good would be my opinion. And if uh, I don't, I don't know what the second part means. Someone says solar powered tactical pineapple question mark. I mean, yeah, glitch did it just uh, two yeah. days ago. So you can check out that video. We have another question. Right. Who would win a capture the flag, Cody or Alex? I gotta say, I can run pretty fast. I was going to say if it's paint, capture the flag in middle school. If it's capture the flag paintball, I think I know. Oh, who win. shoot! Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, you know, I'm I'm picking very carefully what type of game we're we're talking about. Mm -hmm. All right, so we are um, 
pretty pretty much coming up on our time. But um, one more question is, are you going to keep uploading videos to Nullbyte, or will those be our main channel? This is now our main channel, uh, because Nullbyte is owned by Wonder How To, and they are broke. Uh, so they're not paying anybody for episodes anymore, um, and that's why it's just been sitting there for over a year. So no more um, no more anything on the Nullbyte channel. Very sad, but uh, this is where we are now. All right, uh, wait, another question. Can you fly? Um, yes, I'm flying to DEF CON, um, which I believe was another question, uh, if we are going to DEF CON. So far the plan is yes, um, we will be there. We will be um, leading a group of Norwegian journalists around um, and introducing them to hackers. So I've been teaching a class in Norway um, where I teach Norwegian journalists uh, around the country how to do open source intelligence research and how to like find information. And it's been really fun. So they've decided that they had so much fun, they want to come meet some hackers at DEF CON and like, learn about the whole hacking community. So uh, yeah, it's going to be cool to have just a big, just a big posse of, of journalists just constantly following me around. It's going to be really cool. Um, but yeah, so um, I think that we are pretty much out of time. If your video, if your question didn't get answered on this video, you can always leave it in the comments and we will make sure that we answer them next time, which will be next week. So Alex, are you gonna be in the stream next week, you think? I sure hope so. Is that before the Hope Conference? Yes, that should be before okay. the Hope Conference. Yeah. yeah, then I should be. All right, cool. All right, well, we will see you next time. Hopefully, uh, we'll be you will be both um, in focus and not compressed uh, for the next stream. But uh, You're not know, scrambling to grab my charger during this stream. Oh yeah, that too. Uh, but thank you for being on the stream again. I'm sure everyone here missed you. And uh, thank you to everybody in the chat who's given us good suggestions on more videos to do. Again, if we didn't get to your uh, question, it was probably something illegal. Or uh, it might just got buried. It might have gotten buried. So uh, leave it on the YouTube video, and we will try to answer it next week. And we'll see you next yep. time. Bye.